Now, I want to get into Scripture. 1 Thessalonians. We're still in 1 Thessalonians. We've been there a long time, and I'm not apologizing for that because I think it's been really good, and it continues to be good. Even today, after writing the message last week and then restudying it uh, on, on Friday and then restudying it this morning twice, every time I restudy, it's like, oh, I should have put that in there. I should have put that in there. It, it, there's, it's so deep. There's so much. I just love it. So let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 17. But brothers, when we were torn away from you for a short time, in person, not in thought, out of intense longing, we made every effort to see you. For we wanted to come to you. Certainly I, Paul, did again and again, but Satan stopped us. For what is our hope, our joy, and the crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes? Is it not you? Instead, you are our glory and joy. Or indeed, you are our glory and joy. So when we could stand it no longer, in chapter 3 now, when we could stand it no longer, we thought it best to be left by ourselves in Athens. We sent Timothy, who is our brother, and God's fellow worker in spreading the gospel of Christ to strengthen and encourage you in your faith so that no one would be unsettled by these trials. You know quite well that we were, we were destined for them. In fact, when we were with you, we kept telling you that we would be persecuted. And it turned out that, that way, as you well know. For this reason, when I could stand it no longer, I sent to find out about your faith. I was afraid that in some way the tempter might have tempted you and our efforts might have been useless. The word of the Lord. Amen. So every time I get done with a section, I think, well, the next section can't be better than that. And it turns out that it is. And I want to share with you just some background. So the first part of my message today is going to be some background. You'd think that I'd given you enough background already. We've been studying this for months, but there's more background yet. So let me, let me share. Number one, family dyma- dynamic once again. We see it right away. He calls them brothers, and, and he says that we've been orphaned, right? So that family dynamic that we've been seeing over and over again through Thessalonians. And it says that they were separated. It says they were separated as if a child were removed from its mother. That's what he says. That we've been orphaned. He says, as if a child had been removed from mother, ripped away, torn away, and orphaned. I mean, if you get the picture, the imagery there, it's like Paul did not want to leave them. He, he had no choice. He was ripped away, torn away. It's like a, a mother who misses her children because they got orphaned, maybe because of war, maybe because of things that she can't help. And, and it's, Paul is just distraught. He's truly distraught. He hates the fact that he's been separated. Desperately wanted to come back, but stopped by Satan. And that one I found interesting. How is it that Satan stopped Paul from coming back? We'll learn more about that. But let me give you a a real quick idea about that. When you think about Paul being separated from the Thessalonians, and I, I wonder if fear might have been part of it. It's just a thought. I don't know. He might have just been full of fear. I don't know. But do you guys remember when Portland and Seattle were going crazy and it was being overtaken and there was mobs and there was there were people actually taking over blocks of the towns and the cities? Did you have fear to go there? A lot of people did. I didn't want to go there. Did you want to go there? I didn't want to go there either. But Paul actually wants to go there, but guess what he knows? If he goes there, there's a mob waiting for him. They want to kill him. That's what he knows. And I can just imagine if, if I wanted to go be with somebody, but there's a mob that when I get there, they're going to kill me, I wouldn't want to go, would you? So that's just a thought. That's, that's something that the Lord put on my heart actually this morning. Was, was, the, was Satan, the part that he says that Satan was stopping him, was it actually fear? If God's calling you to do something and you don't do it out of fear, is that sin? I think it is. 
If God calls you to do something, I don't know that call, but God was calling Paul to do that. I don't know if he was sinning, but I think that there was some fear involved maybe. I would be afraid. I just like to put it into your head, what was going on here? I mean, they, they went and drug Jason out. And remember back in Acts chapter 17, they drug Jason out and were like, where's Paul? And he's like, well, he's not here anymore. And then they ended up letting Jason go. But if Paul would have been there, they would have persecuted him terribly. I mean, the towns he left, they, they beat him with rods, they jailed him, they stoned him, they thought he was dead. I mean, everywhere he goes, that happens. And I can just imagine Paul, he had just gotten done being stoned, and he went to go to the next town, and he gets beat with rods and put in jail. And he comes to this town, and they, the same thing happened. They, they start persecuting him, they, and the mobs come out, and he's like, I'm out. He did. He left. And they're actually holding him accountable for that. Not, not the Thessalonians, I don't think, but the people that are, that are coming against him saying, he left you. He doesn't care about you. That's what they're saying. I have to found, I, uh, I'm sorry. Um, I just jumped ahead. Okay, so the mobs. And then Satan comes against the leaders of the church. Satan comes against the leaders of the church. Satan was coming against Paul. Why does Satan come against the leaders of the church? Stop him from growing. Stop the, 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 stop the growth of the gospel in this instance where you've got Paul as a leader of the church. If they can stop Paul, they stop, they stop the spread of the gospel. And that's what they want to do. They want to stop the spread of the gospel. We learned about that last week. They want to stop it. And that is why Chauncey sent out a text message this morning. I really appreciate it. He sent one out to all of his, I don't even know who all is in that group, but there's a group of people that are in this text. And he said, Not, don't just pray for your pastor, but pray for the pastors that have left. And he, and he named some pastors. And I appreciated that because for sure, Satan comes against us and tries to stop what we're doing. So many times I want to do so much more I want the church of God, I want the church of Monaz to do so much more, but, but, I, but we can't because for whatever reason, we get stopped up. Maybe it's because people don't do what they're supposed to do. Maybe it's because I haven't done what I'm supposed to do. Maybe it's because what I want isn't necessarily what God wants. And maybe it's because Satan is coming against us and trying to stop the spread of the gospel. And I think more than not, that's the reason. And I think that's what Paul's talking about. He's like, Satan is coming against me. I want to be there, but I can't. Satan keeps stopping me because I want to be there because I want to make sure that this, the gospel is being spread. I want to make sure that it's truth. I want to make sure that it's, it's full, that you're not just sharing parts of it. I want to make sure you're not getting mixed up with the false teachers. I want to make sure all this, but Satan keeps stopping me. And then he says, I have to find out if their faith is keeping them. So why does he want to get there so bad? What's his reason? He wants to find out if their faith is keeping them. He's just, I mean, he left this fledgling church, this young church. He leaves them, and he, and he has to run away. And he's like, what's going on there? Because I was a Hebrew of Hebrews, a Pharisee of Pharisees. I know the law inside and out. I know the scriptures inside and out. I had a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. And when I get persecuted, it is hard not to flee. And this brand new fledgling church has not had the experience I have. They don't have the knowledge that I have. And I had to leave them. And they're there by their, themselves without their father. I'm afraid for them. It's like I've been or, they've been orphaned from me. I can't guide them. I can't direct them. And that's what Paul's got going on. He's, he's afraid that they're, that they're getting, that they're getting um, overtaken by persecution. So that's what's going on. The crown of joy and glory is indeed the faith and relationship with the church. He says, I, my crown and glory is my relationship with you Thessalonians. And it's your relationship with God. And it's the fact that I shared the gospel of Jesus Christ with you. And it's being fulfilled in you. It's becoming fruitful in you. That is my crown. That's my joy. That's my hope. And I'm, I'm, I'm frightened that this is being taken from you. I want to get there. I want to get there so bad. So then in chapter 3, verse 2, we see 
that Paul sent Timothy from Athens even before he wrote the letter. So, so Paul leaves here and he ends up in, in Athens and he sends Timothy away. He's like, he wants to go see him so bad he can't stand it any longer and finally he sends Timothy. This is before the letter. He sends Timothy there and Timothy gets there and he, and he finds out how they're doing. He, he has good reports and he brings it back to Paul and then that's why this letter gets written and he sends Timothy back with the letter. So in chapter 3, 2, we see Paul sent Timothy even before he wrote the letter, the first visit back to the young church by the young disciple Timothy. So I want you to picture that. He's just a young disciple too. We learned in Acts chapter 15 where, he, where actually Paul met Timothy for the first time. That wasn't very long ago. They haven't been spending that much time together. He's a brand new disciple. I know disciples that, that met Jesus years and years and years ago. And I wouldn't be able to trust him to go off and check on the church for me right? But Timothy's a true disciple of Christ. He's actually growing. He's actually acting out in his faith. And Paul sent him to strengthen and encourage. Sometimes do you feel like you need to be strengthened and encouraged? I feel like I need to be strengthened and encouraged all the time. I'll tell you what, this morning's worship strengthened and encouraged me. It encouraged me, man. I was broken over there worshiping our king you know jesus sent the holy spirit to strengthen and encourage us as well it's a really cool thing i love the fact that the holy spirit can live in us and come and be a part of us he sent them to strengthen and encourage to make steady to reinforce to comfort that's what he sent timothy to do and when I think about those words and I think about it in a construction aspect because that's what I used to do and I think about strengthening and I think about concrete needs needs rebar in it or it needs additives to help it be stronger so it doesn't crack right and I think about structures that we build and I was just noticing in my house yesterday that that there's a crack in the in the uh, sheetrock in my ceiling. And my wife probably doesn't know about it yet. But there's a crack in the ceiling. And I was like, oh, I wonder if something needs to be strengthened. I wonder if there's something up in the attic that needs to be strengthened that, that's not supported correctly. Sometimes we need to be strengthened. So Paul sends Timothy to strengthen him. So why was Timothy able to come back? but Paul and Silas were not. That question comes up like, well, wait a minute, if Satan's stopping you to come from coming, how come Timothy got to go? And how come Silas didn't go? And I thought about that, and I questioned that, and I read a bunch of stuff to try to figure out the answer, because I didn't know. But first of all, Timothy was young, and we see that in 1 Timothy 4.12. It says, don't let others look down on you because you're young, right? We, we know that scripture, or some of us do. And he was half Greek, we see that in Acts chapter 16, 1, where, where uh, Paul meets Timothy for the first time. And his mother, I believe, was, I believe his mother was Jew. Does it, oh, you got it up there. Paul came to Debris and then to Listeria, where his, a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was Jew and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. Thank you for putting that up there. Um, I didn't know that she was going to do that because I didn't like specifically tell her to. So, but thank you for that because I'm glad that when I said I think his mother was a Jew that I wasn't wrong because you guys wouldn't have, <laughs> you guys wouldn't have to see it right there. But uh, my point of that, my point about Timothy was young and uh, he was half Greek and he would fit in and not be a threat. So Timothy would fit in and not be a threat. And let me, let me tell you about something else. Timothy, when he comes on with Paul, he comes on just to follow Paul around and basically be a servant. If we go back and we look at Philemon, the book of Philemon, we know that Paul had Onesimus. He was a slave of Philemon. And he's actually just, he's, he's just supporting Paul. That's what he's there for, is to support Paul, to help Paul. He isn't a threat. He's just some young kid who doesn't know anything, and he's just like a servant to Paul. So probably people don't even notice him. Do you guys remember in, uh, in the Gospels when uh, I just read about this this week? I think it was in John, because I'm reading in John right now. And it was about the, the, or the, the, the guy that was blind and couldn't see from birth. And then Jesus heals him on the Sabbath. 
then everybody's all mad at Jesus for healing him on the Sabbath, and then they have to ask questions and, and like, go in and do some inspection to see if this is the same guy. Like, is this really the same guy that's been blind since birth? Because I don't know. And it's like, well, did you not see him begging every day? Aren't you one of the, aren't you one of the religious leaders? Didn't you ever at least give him a nickel? I mean, he was begging so he could eat, and you didn't even notice him? Like, you didn't even recognize him? People don't recognize the people that are, that are below them. You ever think about that? Like, I make it a purpose when I see people that are homeless, and trust me, I've dealt with it in my spirit over and over again. You know, if you don't work, you don't eat, and, and all the different things that come to mind about, about homelessness, and oh, you probably deserve it, you're probably on drugs, and whatever, all the kinds of things that, that I have thought. But you know what? I make it a purpose when I see somebody that's homeless to look at them in the eye Say, how you doing? I want them to know that I recognize that they're a human being created in the image of God. That's what I want them to recognize. Do, do I always give them money? No, but I want to look at them. I want to see their eyes, and I want them to know that I, for one, am not going to just look past them and pretend like they don't exist because they're a human being who is hungry for love and relationship the same as I am. Do you ever think about that? Those people are hungry for it. They're created for it, just like we are. They're created for that relationship. And it's hard, and I know, because I, I've been pretty arrogant about it at times, like, you know. But guys, they're human beings. Yeah, give to the least of these. So, why was Timothy able to come back? Because he wouldn't be a threat. Timothy was a young guy who went along with Paul as a servant or personal assistant. He likely was not even noticed on the first visit. Timothy was not, a dogma was not as dogmatic or forceful as Paul. So they wanted to kill Paul. I mean, Paul's there turning the city upside down, according to them. Is all he's doing is telling about Jesus and telling the good news and telling people they can be set free from bondage. And they're like, no, we don't want to set them free from bondage. And we're so angry about that that we're going to try to kill you, is what, is what happens. But Timothy wasn't as dogmatic and forceful as Paul is. So we know that because Paul actually sent Timothy a letter when he was in Ephesus that says that, uh, he says, here's what he wrote. He said, uh, 1 Timothy says, um, I urge you. Paul says, Timothy, I urge you to, to, to be truthful with the gospel, to give the full gospel. I urge you, and he, he gives him all these things that he urges him to do. Because Timothy might have been a little timid. I mean, timid Timothy, right? He's a little timid. He's like, but timid Timothy compared to us today was probably pretty forceful, <laughs> I'm thinking. I mean, they're dealing with a lot of stuff. Timothy is being... Is it, but regardless of that, in this time frame, this young guy, he's not as forceful, as dogmatic as, as Paul, and he probably wasn't noticed. They weren't trying to kill him. So this is all background for you guys and for me, because I had to learn it too. Also in 3.2, we see Paul explains why he sent Timothy. And here's why. He says, and appeal to them that Timothy is a brother and co-worker and I want you to get this. He's a co-worker in God. That's pretty important. He's not just a co-worker. He's not just a servant. Even the people that he sent him to might have had this idea that Timothy was just, he's just a kid. He's just Paul's servant. What are you sending him to us for? He's not going to help us because I'm sending him to you so he can strengthen you. I'm sending him to you so that he can encourage you. And I'm sending you to him because he's a co-worker in God. He's not just some kid that doesn't know anything. He is a co-worker in God to strengthen and encourage. And God means that God is at work by his spirit in Timothy's ministry. God is at work through his spirit in Timothy's ministry. Did you know that God is at work through his spirit, through our ministry here at Monaz? You better believe he is, because if he wasn't, I couldn't do anything up here. 
If he wasn't, I, would, I wouldn't be able to even, even have a voice. The Holy Spirit is at work in, in, in this ministry, just like he was in Timothy's ministry. Timothy is a partner with Paul and God to do what? To bring the message of Christ. That's always what it's about. That's even why when I prayed and I talked about the song that we sang that kept on talking about the king and t talking about, but I, and correct me if I'm wrong, Tim, but I don't think it once says Jesus' name. Lord, you are good. I agree with that. But it doesn't say Jesus. Because some people put, make Lord a lot of different things. But we have to use the name of Jesus. He is good. Jesus is good. He is my Lord. Yeah, that's good. So, let's get on with it. Oh, I have a couple of other notes that I added here last minute. Um, Paul is dealing with regret that he's ripped away, right? We understand that. He's dealing with regret. He wishes he hadn't been ripped away. And I wonder, as part of that whole Satan thing, did Jason promise Paul would not return? You know, when I read scripture, you have to read between the lines a little bit to try to understand the context of what's going on. But remember, they drag Jason out in front of everybody. And they, and they drag him out. And, and Jason's defending himself. He's a brand new believer. And I wonder, did Jason promise that, I promise Paul won't come back. He's gone. He's not coming back. So then Paul can't come back for that reason? I don't know. I'm just guessing. I'm just guessing. I don't know what was happening there, but that's an idea. Did Paul run away in fear? I talked about that already. Is he not coming back due to fear? Man, I don't think so. <laughs> I really don't think so. Paul was a stud, man. That guy, not much stopped him. I don't know of anything that stopped him. I know beatings didn't stop him. I know stonings didn't stop him. I know shipwrecks didn't stop him. I know even the fear of going to Jerusalem when everybody was telling her, uh, to Jerusalem and then off to Rome when everybody's telling him, hey, don't go, don't go. It's sure death. He's like, yeah. To die is gain. Because I'm going to go and I'm going to tell people about my King Jesus. My Lord Jesus. I'm going to go tell everybody I can find. And if I have to die doing it, I'm going to die doing it. If God wants to protect me, then he'll protect me. If he doesn't, then I gain and I get to go to heaven. That's how Paul thought. So was he afraid? I doubt it. But I always have to think about well, how would I respond. Just because I might respond in fear doesn't mean Paul did. How would you respond? Like, that's why I say that stuff. It's to get you to think, how would I respond in this? Like, I'm looking at the history, the background, what was happening when, when this is written, and how would I respond to this? There's, there's, there's people tearing me away. I want to come back. How would I respond? Maybe it was the Lord that didn't send him back because he wanted Timothy to go back so Timothy could grow because we're always supposed to teach people how to, how to lead, Right? I was just talking to the staff about that this morning because in Numbers chapter 8, it tells the people, it tells, he tells Moses that the Levites are only supposed to serve as Levites from the age of 25 to 50, and then they're supposed to retire and only help. Right, Dwayne? There's a lot to that. I could go into that deeper. That's probably a whole other sermon series. I mean, our staff talked about it for a half hour this morning. But as what it relates to me is, is just like what's going on here, is maybe, maybe, maybe Paul couldn't go back because God wanted to use something, whatever Satan was doing, God wanted to use it so that Paul could be a better discipler and disciple Timothy so that he could actually go back and build on his leadership. And did you guys know if you're good at something, here's what I'm going to say something. I'm going to say something right now. I'm going to call somebody. If you want to learn how to be a servant of the Most High God in the greatest way that I know, follow Harvey around for about a month. 
and you're going to learn what it looks like to be a servant. Or Pat. There's a lot of other people you could follow around too that are pretty good. Chauncey's pretty good too. Miss, Missy's pretty good. Shelly's pretty good. There's a lot of good servants out here. Mark's a pretty good servant too. Guys, if you, if you want to learn what it's like to serve the Most High God, pick somebody that you, that you, that you trust, somebody that you, you see and you go, man, I, I have respect for that person, man or woman. I'm, I, want to, I want to know how they do it. Go just ask them and get in their pocket and follow them around. Do church with them. Do ministry with them. Learn how they do it. That's what we do with, the, with Jesus. We follow the master. We follow the master. And what did the master do? He washed feet. What did the master do? He died for us. He wrote our names in his hand, according to the song that we sing today. And I think it's nail holes. That's what comes to my mind when I hear that. The sins that I have were nailed right through his hands and feet. What time is it? Holy mackerel, I'm not even going to get close to done today. Well, I finally got through my introduction. <laughs> today our message is about the intense, hear that, the intense longing of Paul. The things that Paul puts his hope, glory, and joy in. That's what we're going to talk about today. Today we'll ask God where my hope, glory, and joy is. What is my crown? What do I put my hope, glory, and joy in? What is my crown? And just pulling it right out of the scripture. And, and Paul's hope, glory, and joy, he says, is the Thessalonian people. My hope, glory, and joy is when people that I've discipled, people that I've poured into, respond to the gospel and fruit comes out of their life. That's my hope, glory, and joy. So point one is intense longing. Paul has this intense longing. My brothers and sisters, when we were orphaned by being separated from you for a short time, in person, not in thought, out of our intense longing, we, were, we made every effort to see you. For we wanted to come to you, certainly I, Paul, did again and again, but Satan blocked our way. So Paul has this intense longing to be with them. So let's, let's think about that for a minute. Intense longing. What do you have intense longing for? Paul had intense longing to be with the Thessalonian church. That's what he had intense longing for. Do we have intense longing to see our disciples or church brothers and sisters? Do we have intense longing for that? Like, think about it. Look around at your neighbors, the people behind you. You don't have to tell them I love you this week unless you want to. But when you look around and you, and you look at your brothers and sisters, do you have intense longing to spend time with them? I do. I have intense longing to spend time with my brothers and sisters. I really do. And when I see people I haven't seen for a while, I, I, I just can't wait to get over and say hi to them. By the way, Larry, I just really wanted to say hi to you this morning, but I was talking to other people and I just never made it. I love you. You guys are getting a little bit of the um, emotional mic because I didn't sleep good for two days in a row. Adopt the ways of Jesus. If we want to have an intense longing to spend time with our brothers and sisters in Christ, we need to adopt the ways of Jesus. Have you adopted the ways of Jesus in your life? Do you know the word well enough to adopt the ways of Jesus? We need to adopt the ways of Jesus. We need to be present in the moment. Larry, do you know why I didn't come and talk to you when I saw you come in and I really wanted to go say hi? Because I was present in the moment with the person that I was talking to. We need to be present in the moment with whoever we're talking to. 
Be present. Don't just be there. Don't just be here at church on Sunday morning. Be present in the moment. Jesus was present in the moment of everything that he did. Like, he would go and see people. He would talk to people. He would heal people. And whoever he was with, that's who he was with. Even when he's walking in the crowds of people and the lady touches the hem of his garment and she's healed and he feels power go from him, he, he stops and he's on his way somewhere. And along the way, somebody t- touches him and he feels power go and he stops and he says, who did that? And he stops the whole procession and he just looks at that one person in the eyes and, and she's, it's just amazing. Jesus was was. He, he was purposeful about everything that he did. He was relational about everything that he did. He had intense longing to spend time with people. He had intense longing to build relationships with people. He had intense longing to be in relationship with the Father so much that he said, I only do what the Father tells me. Do you only do what the Father tells you? Or do you do a whole bunch of other things also instead of? I'm guilty of both. I'm guilty of all three. Sometimes I only do what the Father says. Sometimes I do a whole bunch of other things on top of it. And sometimes, probably, I don't know when the last time I could say that, but I I don't do what the Father says. I think I do what the Father says. When God tells me to do something, I do it. How about you? Is that you? I mean, I stand up here every week and I just tell you, I just pour it all out. This is me. And I say, ah, sometimes I don't do what the Father says. Sometimes I do what the Father says and a whole bunch more. But do you reflect inside and go, how about, how about, how about you? How about me? Do I do what the Father says? Do I only do what the Father says? Because we want to become more like Christ, right? And he only did what the Father said. I love that. How did he know what the Father said? Other than he was the Son of God sent here. But how did he know? Because he was a human. He was fully human. He was fully God. While he was here, he didn't have all the powers that God has. He didn't know everything that was going on all the time. But what did he do? He spent time with the Father daily. Every day. Do you spend time with the Father daily? You know, somebody yesterday, I was, yesterday I was working, I was um, harvesting Christmas trees with a friend of mine, and it wasn't for free. He paid me really good, actually. I was, whoa, I was really blessed. But I was harvesting Christmas trees, and they said, well, what do you, they said, well, tomorrow's Sunday, we get to sleep in a little bit. I said, well, Sunday is not my day to sleep in anymore now that with my new job. And they said, well, what time do you get up? I said, well, about 4.30. Well, why do you get up at 4.30? Are you not prepared? I said, yeah, I'm prepared. But I want to spend a lot of time with Jesus before I go preach. Man, guys, we got to spend time with Jesus if we want to know what he's about and what, his, what he wants us to do. You know, our church isn't grandma and grandpa's church anymore. Is that good or bad? I, I don't know. If it's like Christ, it's good. If it's moving away from Christ, it's bad. That's what I say about that. So you take all those things and you, and you, you look at them and, and every time somebody comes and says, well, I don't like this about the church or that about the church, I, I listen and then I go, does it reflect Christ or not? Does it reflect Christ or not? And if it doesn't, then I want to change it. But if it reflects Christ, I want to do what reflects Christ and brings believers to the feet of Jesus. That's what I want to do. And I think that's what our church wants to do. But it's not grandma and grandpa's church anymore. Church was not just something that grandma and grandpa did. It wasn't just a place they go. It wasn't just something they did because they had nothing better to do. Grandma and Grandpa's church was everything to Grandma and Grandpa. It was their entertainment. 
It was their family. It was their pastime. It was what they looked forward to. And, I, and as I think about that, and I don't know if you guys are, are getting a hold of what I'm saying, but church to them wasn't just something they did, it was who they were. I think Pastor Steve used to say that. It isn't just what, what, what they did, it's who they were. Because everything revolved around church. They didn't just add church when they had time. But everything revolved around church, and church became what they were and what they did because they loved Jesus. And if you go to church because it's your entertainment, then that's the wrong reason. You want to come to church because you love Jesus and you want to get filled up with him. And I want to get filled up with Jesus. And when I come to church, I get filled up with Jesus. Do I get filled up with Jesus when I'm at home? I do. But it's not the same as when two or three are gathered or 100, or 150, or 175 are gathered. When 150, 175 are gathered, and we come and worship together, man, I get filled up. I don't want church to just be something I do when I have time. I want church to be something I do all the time, because it's who I am, it's what I'm about, it's what I care about. And the reason I care about it, let me tell you, I care about it because we are about sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with people. That's why I care about it. If it was just hanging out with people and singing songs, I wouldn't do it. I would maybe when I had time. But it's about sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's about teaching you guys the word of God so that you guys can go and share it with other people. But if we just receive it and we don't send it out, what are we? We're like a bank account that, you know, you don't get to take it. You don't get, what does it say? You don't get to take all your treasure to heaven with you or whatever. It's just going to get buried with you. You know, there's scriptures about that that says that that people receive, receive things and they just go bury it. And God's like, whoa. You guys, you can't just bury the things I give you and not share it with people, not grow it, not multiply it. We have to multiply. That's what discipleship is. So what am I getting at? Grandma and Grandpa's church, they looked forward to being with one another. And what happened? Because it's not Grandma and Grandpa's church anymore. And to be honest with you, I don't think it reflects Jesus as much as it used to. Sometimes I think it's still, it's, it does. It does. Some things, I think, reflect Jesus all the time in the church. But it doesn't reflect Jesus as much as it used to. And let me tell you what changed. Jeopardy. No, I'm serious. I thought I'd get more of a reaction to that. Jeopardy changed. TV changed. The internet changed. VCRs changed. DVD players changed. Netflix changed. When you drive down the road on a Wednesday night and you look in all the ma- windows of people's houses, and, and if, if, you know, sometimes through the curtains you can see light coming through, sometimes they don't have curtains, whatever, and it's this blue tinge color. It's the TV's on all the time. And instead of reading God's word, instead of praying, instead of coming to church and helping out on Wednesday with the youth group, you know, we got over 100 kids coming every Wednesday. It's pretty cool. They are hungry for love. And so many people can help, but they're watching TV. They're on the internet. They're doing all these things. Now, let me say this. Am I guilty of watching TV and, and surfing the internet sometimes looking for things? Yeah, I do it. I relax too. But I don't do it for four hours every single night while I eat chips and wonder why I can't lose weight. Right? I mean, I'm just being, I'm just being real. What kind of efforts did we put forth to spend time together? You know, this next section's a good one. I haven't even finished point one. This next section's a good one. I'm gonna, I don't want to cut it in half. I'm going to stop right there, right after Grandma and Grandpa's church. And I'm, gonna, I'm just going to close with something, and, and worship team can come up. The Thessalonian church was in need 
of a Savior. And Paul showed up and he presented the Savior. They were in need of a Savior because they had sin in their life. I was in need of the Savior when somebody told me about Jesus. Were you in need of a Savior? Are you in need of a Savior today? You guys, we need to be people that long to spend time with God and each other. And until that happens, we're just going to keep going through this cycle. We're just going to keep going through this cycle. We need to long to spend time together. We need to actually love people. We need to ask God to teach me how to love. Do you guys know I, I pray that all the time? Because I want to be more like Jesus. And I say, God, teach me how to love people more. Teach me how to not just love people that, that like, oh, I love you. No, Larry, I, I truly do love you. God, teach me how to love people that way. Teach me how to long to spend time with God and to long to spend time with each other. Teach me not to get off on one track and going, well, I'm too busy. I need to make money. I need, to, I need a new car. I need a new motorcycle. I need, I need, I need, I need, I need. Help me not to get off on that track, God, but just stay focused on what you want me to do and to do only what you want me to do. I don't want to do anything else. I don't care how hard it is. I don't care how easy it is. I want to know what Jesus wants me to do, what God wants me to do, what the Father wants me to do, and I want to do that. In order to do that, I got to spend time in His Word, and I got to spend time getting to know who He is and who His people are. Amen?